Um, so this is the actual player list, not like the, the hidden player names. Uh, we did have Hera winning his first event, which is obviously really great for him. He has never won a big S tier tournament before, and he played incredibly well, and this is 100% well-deserved. Jordan, of course, is back, getting second place. So Jordan had to beat MBL, and then ACCM, and then Mr. Yo, and then eventually he did lose to Hera in a pretty meh finals, it must be said. Uh, the big series of the tournament, uh, there were a couple of them, I think, that really stood out. And they were uh, Tato versus Hera in the round of 16, which is like, it's crazy to think of these two guys, you know, in the round of 16. But that's just how the tournament works. And especially, in my opinion, game number five is the best game of the tournament, in my opinion. Would definitely recommend a rewatch on that. I'm sure it's on T90's YouTube channel. Um, or if you're watching it soon, it's in my VODs. If you want to see my cast. Uh, anyway, the uh, Viper versus Hera series as well. We'll talk more about the, uh, the drama around it, but still very, very excellent close series of AoE 2. And other than that, meh performances from MBL. Uh, Dogao kind of burned out against the Viper, but that was like a really like bop of a set. Uh, Back made it past Vivi, but then got smashed by Viper. Tato played, I think, some of the best Age of Empires that he has played in a long time. Like, Tato had some really strong games. Unfortunately, he was against Hera in the first round, who also was playing so strong that he won the tournament, you know? I, I think uh, other than the the Viper losing to Hera in a super close match in the semifinals, and then uh, Hera winning, and then Jordan, uh, Mr. Yo making it to the semifinals, all of that stuff. Yeah, let's talk about the in-game stuff. Switch in to over here. And then over here. Oh yeah, there we go. So... Hidden Cup meta. Now, uh, I will pull up the stat sheet in a little bit, but before I jump into that, some of the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, low RNG maps. Every single map in Hidden Cup 4 had very low amounts of random stuff that could spawn. Your resources were always in a certain way. Relic spawns were almost always fixed. Uh, and then just a lot of the maps, the whole architecture was based around being a largely set map which did lead to very consistent results, but also made a lot of strategies quite predictable. In AoE 2, we both treasure the fact that the game mode we mostly play is called random map, right? It is random maps, but also uh, we want to minimize the impact of RNG. And this is a really delicate balance to strike, and there is no right answer. Different people are going to want different things. Personally, I felt like the these maps were too fixed, and it just led to a lot of the same game in a lot of ways over and over again. Like Hidden Cup 4 had had some great games. It also had a lot of really boring games. Now, of course, not every game in a tournament can be a knockout, but I feel like, eh, a lot of, lot of meh games. And I feel like the maps do play some part in that. Uh, I'll talk more about the maps in a little bit. Um, something that was, I believe, different starting with this Hidden Cup is that players could not see the games of the people they played before. Like, so say one player advanced to the round of from the round of 16 to the round of 8, they could not see their opponent's round of 16 game. So we had a lot of teams prepare specific strategies with specific sieves on specific maps, which again led to the same thing we're seeing over and over again from uh, the larger teams. It It is at least cool to see how teams can come up with these sorts of strategies on these maps and then how they interact with their opponents. And I do think that there is some merit to doing that and it wasn't a concept that I think totally failed, and I think that the biggest concern is, one, the lack of variety, like I said, but two, I think a lot of players would prefer to not have the hidden aspect at all and would just want to know who they're up against in terms of practicing because then you don't want to be practicing with somebody that you're ending up facing in the round of 16, right? That's just the tournament concept, which I'll talk more to in a little bit, but that's just, it's just the way it is. Uh, laming success. Laming was allowed in Hidden Cup, but again, with the very, very fixed map design, uh, your boars or boar equivalents uh, were always pretty much in the back of your base, which would make it more difficult to lame. But because you knew where your opponent was most of the time, you could still lame if you wanted anyway. Now, this wasn't Hidden Cup 3, which, was which you know, had the finals that was decided by four lames from the Viper. And although there was some success with laming, people didn't seem as eager to go for it. Um, you know, there is a fair amount of risk involved, obviously. Like, laming definitely impacted a few games quite heavily. 
but it certainly wasn't a big determining factor in a large amount of the uh, the matches, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and then polarized sieve slash map choices. I'll get to this in just a second. We saw a lot of the same thing over and over and over again, especially when it came to specific sieves on specific maps. Like you have a, of a sieve draft that you do after your map draft, right? All of the di all the maps are obviously a little bit different from one another, so there is usually two to three, maybe four sieves. Those sieves represent like at least 90% of the games played on these specific maps, which is kind of ha what happens when you have a draft that is, you have like several different maps and you can only pick each sieve once. It's like, okay, well, this is the best sieve for this map. This is the best sieve for this map. This is the best sieve for this map. And then you just play those on those maps. So speaking of all this stuff, let's go to the spreadsheet. So this is another spreadsheet courtesy of Nerfox. Uh, let me just go through the maps real quick. There were 15 sets since it's a single elimination best of 16. Yeah, um, Arabia always being game number one, so that was played a logical amount. Bay was played six times, which is a decent amount. Uh, Bypass five times, we saw that fairly often. That was one of the new maps for the event. And it was, uh, as you can, as I'll show you in just a bit, completely preferred over Hideout. Uh, Cross was actually banned a lot interestingly, but it was still played a bunch. It's just a very standard tournament map. Then you had Cup, which was played a ton and was especially notable in that Harrow did really, really well on this map, just personally as a player. Uh, you had Gold Rush, which was literally played once, which I was quite surprised with because Gold Rush is usually a very popular map. Hideout banned six times and just never played, which I found to be surprising. Like the map was a complete failure in terms of being a part of this tournament, which is pretty feels bad, man. Uh, High Tides was played fairly often, I would say. Uh, Islands played a bunch, probably a little too much for some people. Mudflow, uh, another one of those maps that just was coming out for the tournament specifically, played a ton as players had specific set strategies for the map. And I am in the way for the last one, so I'll move myself a little bit more. So you had Quarry, which was pretty much only played once, I think, in a draft, and once because they were forced to play the map. I would say this map was overall a big flop in terms of being part of the tournament. It was just almost never seen. And then Slopes was seen so, so, so much in the qualifiers, but actually saw very little play in the main event as players just kind of picked it at the edge of their drafts. And then just usually we never got that far. So that's the sort of map distribution. As you can see, there was definitely a, there was a somewhat okay, even ish distribution, but there was definitely a big priority in favor of maps like uh, Cup, and what was the other one? Islands. That brings us to the sieves and sieves per map. So you have, starting with the, the sieves that you saw literally ubiquitously, in 100% of the drafts, these sieves were seen in some way. You had Aztecs, 100%, Chinese, Lithuanians at 100%, Mayans, Mongols both at 100%, and Vikings at 100%. That is one, two, three, four, five, six civilizations. That's a lot of you're seeing the same thing over and over again. And there were a lot of sieves that were seen most of the time. A lot of, you know, these sieves you saw four, five, six games. Japanese seen the most. They actually weren't in every draft, but seen in 93% of drafts. And they were just played a ton because there are so many freaking hybrid maps in this map pool. Uh, and then you have sieves like Italians and Portuguese played a ton, but like only on one, maybe two specific maps. Franks, you're seeing in specific maps. Britons, notably, with a 100% win rate, six wins and zero losses, which is interestingly, I believe, like the exact opposite, pretty much, of their KOTD3 results, where they, they had an absolutely awful win rate, which I think speaks to, more than anything, sample size. This is not a massive sample size for games, even for, like, a tournament. Uh, then you had Aztecs and Vikings, who were banned, like, all the time, as people just did not want to go up against those civs. Oh yeah, the civs that were just never seen at all, neither of the new civs, Sicilians and Burgundians, were ever drafted or played unfortunately, but those two sieves are just not very good right now. Burmese were never played or drafted. Cumans, Ethiopians, Incas, um, pretty surprising to me. Magyars were drafted once, but never played. I guess Teutons were drafted once, but never played. So definitely several sieves that just never saw any play, and a bunch of sieves were seen very, very little, which is definitely unfortunate, I would say, as there was a, a lot of the same stuff we're seeing over and over again. And I think that brings us to specific sieves on specific maps. You have, say, Arabia. Obviously, it's seen in every series. You just see the two meso sieves picked all the time. You know, there are 15 games on this map. 
12 of them featured one of the two Mesosivs, Vikings or Mayans, Mayans being played the most. And we saw a smattering of other civilizations. Hera had some success with Bulgarians against the two Mesosivs. Um, and then Vikings was seen, I think Jordan played them twice and Valesa maybe once. Uh, That's kind of, I think, player specific. And I'm surprised that we didn't see Vikings picked on other maps uh, where they might be a bit better. But it is what it is. And Jordan did pretty well, so can't really fault him there. Bay was played a lot, and it's just Italians played on this map a few times. Mongols a few times. I mean, we saw what? One, two, three, four, five, six different civs. Six, this map was played six times. So, yeah. A lot of the same thing. Bypass p played five times. Four of the five games included Malay. Three of the five games included Turks. So I think we then saw Malay versus Turks twice. And because we're only seeing these maps, like, a few times each, mostly, it's like we're just seeing, oh, okay, this is the same thing. And this is the same thing. Cross played four times. Literally, Huns were in every single game of Cross. Cup. Played seven times. Celts were picked seven times. We saw Celts in every single game of Cup, which was one of the most popular maps of the tournament. And for some reason, people kept on picking them despite them having an absolutely terrible win rate. 29%, uh, not too great. Fun fact. Uh, and then Britons being three and zero. But that was mostly uh, thanks to uh, Hera playing really, really well with them. Uh, I think it's a lot of the Celts picking was just thinking back to Hidden Cup 3 when Celts were picked all the time, but that's because the meta back then was very Drush-centric, where Celts were super good because they had the faster-moving militia. That's not a thing anymore, so I think that kind of kind of struggled there. Gold Rush was only seen once, Hideout literally never seen. High Tides, I feel, was a big flop of a map as a spectator. I felt like this, okay, this map was played five times and was, none of the games were good. Like, I didn't see a single good game on this map. It was just, okay, fight super hard for the water. Whoever wins the water wins the game. That's not particularly compelling experience. And just Japanese were very, very good, obviously, in doing that 3-in-1 overall. Like, so many games of those five were just, okay, well, the Japanese player won water. Now there are, like, 10 villagers ahead, with 10 of those being Japanese fishing ships. Oh, boy. So, personally, maybe people have different opinions. Maybe people like those games. I personally don't. Um, islands, there was a very, I think now infamous game on Islands where it was in the finals, Jordan versus Hera, and Jordan just sat there up with Fatorias and just waited until Hera ran out of resources and then Jordan won by default. I think that's a problem with Fatorias, less so than a problem with Islands, but played eight times. There's actually an okay-ish amount of diversity we saw, but picks like Vietnamese and, uh, Celts were, I think, very specifically throwaway picks because they just accepted that their opponents were going to win the map because they had prioritized getting Italians or Portuguese, uh, which were seen as just the two best civs. Uh, Vikings, I think, surprisingly never played here, but I think that's because Vikings didn't want to run into Portuguese. And I think just a big problem with this map in its current existence is just the way the Fatorias work and with Portuguese also being a very good water civ because of it. But that's, I think, more a Fatoria problem than an island problem. So again, topic for a different video. Mudflow, I wasn't a really big fan of this map. It had some okay games, but it also had a lot of really meh games, and it was just played nine times. Franks, Indians, Khmer, these civs were seen a bunch, and we had a few other civs thrown here and there, but they had very limited success. Uh, Quarry, Britons won twice, but map was barely played, and then Slopes very rarely played as well. So here you can see that, okay, we have players that are going, you know, some of the players that go far, all of them are on the same teams or practice together. They practice specific civs for specific maps. You know, sometimes they work out, and if they work out, then they go to the next round where they do the exact same thing again because their opponent in the previous in the previous round didn't see their game. And yeah, I feel like that it's interesting like the first time you see it, but then you see it in like subsequent games, and you're just like, okay, I've seen this already. But again, that's just my opinion. And I suppose that brings us to the whole community meta talking bit of this video, which is probably already going on too long because I like to ramble. All right, so now let's talk about the more community-driven side of things, as I'm sure this is the reason I think a lot of you watch this video, as much as I love to talk about AoE 2. There's always drama, and it's, it's always, I think, important to consider a big event like Hidden Cup and how that fits into the community. First and foremost, I definitely congratulations to T90. The event was, I think, unequivocally a big success. Uh, we did hit a viewer record, I think it was 67k, might be wrong with that. Um, and I hope that a lot of people who are brought into the community from Hidden Cup uh, stay here, because that is that was the case in a lot of the previous ones. And uh, yeah, it's always great to see new faces. So that said, of course, there were some <clears throat> issues. First is the tournament format. And I think this is 
part of a broader issue of just how AoE2 tournaments work out right now. So a lot of people had a, had issues with Hidden Cup being as big an event as it was in terms of being like one of the biggest, highest prestige, I guess you could say, tournaments in the entire AoE2 world. And it's Hidden Cup, right? It's a gimmick tournament. And a lot of players don't like the whole Hidden Cup thing. They just want a straight up tournament that they can show their skills in. And I think a lot of viewers don't like the fact that you don't know who you're cheering for. The format uh, also lends itself to you. If you don't watch every single game of the event, you can kind of get lost because you don't really know who's who. You missed some games. You know, you're trying to look at some tells. Your chat's just spamming random stuff here and there. And it can make it a little bit confusing. And because it's, you know, hidden, right? You have a completely random seated bracket. It's single elimination. So you have people like Tato and MBL losing in the first round because they were up against super strong opponents. It just happened to be that way. You had the top half of the bracket, which was noticeably weaker than the bottom half of the bracket, which had three of the four top four players of... Uh, it had Viper, Hera, and Leary. And then it was just Yo on the other side of the bracket. And of course, Jordan even beat Yo, but that was, that was a Jordan thing. Uh, and it's obviously super great for him. But of course, the viewers absolutely love it. And the reason I said that it's sort of part of a, a bigger issue is that almost all tournaments are driven around specific, like, caster personalities, mostly. Streamer personalities, I guess I should say. And that's because you have, like, T90 with Hidden Cup, Mem with KOTD and Bayo A, uh, Nilly with uh, his deathmatch stuff, and then, of course, NAC. And that's most of the stuff. And then you have Red Bull, which is, like, the only independent organization that is having big events. So what you get are situations where the biggest event is just the one that is happens to be attached to the biggest tournament organizer, who is in this case T90. And it kind of started as just like a gimmick, like fun event for viewers. That's definitely in the spirit, I think, of T90 in the stream. But it's not, I think, what a lot of people would want to sort of be like the flagship AOE2 tournament, because we just don't have that. It just doesn't exist. There is no Microsoft not just Microsoft sponsored, but Microsoft organized event that is like independent of all of the uh, the casters and stuff. And I do think that is a problem just because I think AOE2 could really benefit from having a league like format. Because then I think players, if the prize pool for Hidden Cup wasn't so big, then you could have players, I think, goof around a lot more and try and impersonate one another because they almost certainly don't bother doing that for a tournament that's this important for them, right? It's like this is a super serious tournament with a really gimmicky format, which I think does threaten its competitive validity. I was reading a lot of the, the feedback threads just because reading other people's feedback so I can generate my feedback a bit better. Uh, stream length was, I think, a issue for a lot of people and a lot of those people being streamers like myself. But not just streamers, uh, the casters, the viewers as well. They were long days. They were really long days. The first three days were over nine hours. No, no. The third day, I think, was a little under nine hours. The first two days were definitely over nine hours. And the third day was like 12 hours. That's too much. <laughs> it's it's too much to cast for a caster and too much to watch as a viewer. Like, you need to watch the tournament, the whole tournament, to really appreciate it, I think. And I guess that gimmick is good for just, like, keeping people there to watch instead of just... You know, oh, I just want to watch the Vipers match, you know? You know, you're just like, oh, who's the Viper? But that's like, that's just a gimmick, right? And I, I feel like a lot of people, especially in the earliest parts of the stream and the latest parts of the stream where it was either too early in North America for people to get up. I should know. I had to get up at like 7, 8 a.m. every day. Uh, and then as it was getting late over in Europe, as the streams were dragging on, uh, then I think a lot of people just weren't able to watch the matches. I know a lot of people tuned out to, of the player reveals just because it was so late at night in Europe on a work work night, a Sunday night. And I feel like going forward, it would be best if we did the event over two weekends in the same way that Red Bull does their events. I know the idea is to, okay, you have a single big event weekend. I mean, it's like the Super Bowl in America, right? It's just one day, you know, all of the hype goes into that one day. And that you can kind of expand that. Okay, it's all one weekend. But I think it's too many games. <laughs> there, there are too many games in a day, and it leads to fatigue. Viewer fatigue, I'm, I'm talking about. I was just talking about caster fatigue as well. I mean, yes, I, I get tired and would like not to have to cast 9 to 10 hours a day. 
But I think the quality of our casting suffers, and this is for everybody, myself included. I definitely noticed that towards the end of my other streams, especially in the later days, I was kind of talking more slowly and less often. And from the feedback that I saw, I wasn't watching T90 stream, obviously, but apparently T90 was definitely getting a little fatigued towards the end because it's just so much. Uh, obviously, he's trying to hype everything up, and I'm sure is very hyped about it, but is also very stressed about it. And it's just a lot for anybody. Uh, even Robo doing all the adminning stuff, I'm sure it was very exhausting. Some people said that we should get more, you know, more casters. And I mean, as a caster, obviously, I'm, I'm biased and say, of course, I'd love to be more involved in the event and whatever. But I think that's not necessarily the correct way at looking at things. We did have okay-ish breaks, except in the last day where things were kind of pedaled to the metal. It was more a matter of, it's, it's T90's tournament. T90 is going to want to cast all of the games for his own tournament on his own channel because everything for Hidden Cup is focused on T90 because again it's his like intellectual property right so having like different casters come on like if he's not involved in the casting on his own channel it becomes really weird because T90 isn't you know he's not like an organization right he's 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 a guy he's a streamer and it would make sense for like Red Bull having you know different casters that you can swap in and out to prevent like fatigue and then you can have different caster uh mix-ups all that stuff. Nearly did do this with uh, NAC, obviously, but that was as much because one, players casting their friends' games is a big draw for people, and also no human can do that much casting. But I feel like, again, this is because we're lacking that sort of central Microsoft organized event where you can actually just swap people in and out and give people appropriate breaks and still have that very high level of production quality as well as big viewer draw that, you know, you're looking for. I should probably move on because I do a lot of rambling. So set maps, this was the sort of the last big drama. So in the Viper versus Hera set, we had game one. Why don't I just pull this up? Very, very forward thinking Ornlu. Okay, so Viper versus Hera. Game one was set as Arabia. Game Four was set as Bypass. Game 7 was set as Mudflow. These three maps were set before anything, you know, any sort of drafting happened. And then they had to draft three maps. So Viper drafted three maps and so did Hera. It's also loser picks the home map except for the set maps, which are set. So you have the situation where, okay, Viper wins game number one. It's a set map, so it goes and then to Hera's home map, which is then cross, which Viper also wins. Then it goes to Hera's second home map. Bay, and then Hera wins that, and then it can't go to Viper's home map because it's then the set map of Bypass, which Hera wins, and then Viper gets his one home map of Quarry, and then Hera gets another home map, which is Cup, and then in the set map, which Hera wins, obviously, and then that Viper does not get a home map and he has to go to Mudflow. So we're in a situation where Hera got to play, I believe, three home maps. He got to play Cross, Bay, and Cup, whereas Viper only ever got to play Quarry as his own home map. A lot of people, including Viper himself, definitely thought that wasn't fair. I think that it does feel kind of bad if you're Viper, because then, and it also feels really bad for Hera, right? Because then people take, people question like, okay, how much did Hera deserve this win? When, I mean, like the dude was playing out of his mind. And I mean, I, I think you can't fault Hera or like, you know, say, take anything away from Hera though, because he unfortunately, but also kind of fortunately, I guess, had to go through Tato, Leary, the Viper, and then Jordan in the finals, which is obviously a very, very difficult bracket. But I think that, okay, if you're going to do set maps, you might need to do them all in the beginning and then just do home maps from there. Or like, why don't do home maps at all? Just do seven set home or seven, not just seven set maps. There we go. That might need be the way to go. I think game one is Arabia has been like the norm throughout all of the events recently as in like the last years and i think that's probably here to stay it's arabia right it's the classic it's a great way to sort of introduce the players to each other and then you know the viewers to the matchup so i think that's fine but then from there things get a bit trickier oh i, I forgot to mention earlier we also had a lot of maps that were we had a lot of hybrid maps and a lot of maps that were kind of late game oriented without being super clownish you had like bypass and then you had hideout but hideout was like never played but then like a lot of the maps were just kind of like wall to go to late game which kind of dragged out the streams even more, you know what I mean? Like it all kind of fits together. And yeah, I think there's probably room for improvement there, which I guess brings me to the last point, role of Hidden Cup going forward. Hidden Cup is always going to be one of the biggest events in the AoE2 community, just 
how it is. And it's a fun event, right? I feel like it would be good for the community as a whole if it wasn't like one of the biggest events, right? Because it's it's a gimmick tournament. And those are fine. Like those those are great and have their own role. I would say that NAC is something fairly similar to this. I would say that NAC is probably a bit more, I guess, competitively like legitimate, but it's still not completely there because a lot of it's invites, many of the players who are just like hanging around a lot of the time and are casting and stuff like that. By default, Hidden Cup is like, you know, one of the big flagship events for the game, and we don't have anything that would replace that, right? There's nothing else that can sort of be, this is like the big deal, right? This is our World Cup or whatever sports analogy. And I feel like Hidden Cup, its inherent imbalances and unfairities, uh, I, I made that word up, by the way, they will make a lot of people feeling not too satisfied with how the event is going, but that's just like... You can't say, oh, like these are problems with the event when that's just the event concept itself. Like Hidden Cup being not fair because the players have a random bracket and don't know each other. Like that's just the gimmick. That's the draw for viewers, right? And I think that people would feel less bad about that if it wasn't such a, you know, prestigious quote unquote title, I guess. But of course, as it stands right now, this is what we have. And going forward, who knows? Who knows what we'll see? I, I certainly don't know. <laughs> Um, I'll just keep casting events. Uh, so I guess that said, wrap things up. Of course, definitely big kudos to T90 for running uh, such a successful event. And of course, letting it be open streaming so I can also enjoy it as a caster. Um, obviously, Robo doing as about as good a job as possible at keeping the show rolling on a good, consistent pace without random long breaks. But yeah, I definitely hope you guys enjoyed watching. It made you maybe think about, okay, what is what is it like to have a tournament in the AoE2 space right now? And of course, would love to hear your comments in the comment section where those things go below. Definitely feel free to disagree with me and of course, think about what you want in a tournament and what do you want in a hidden cup? You know, those two things, not necessarily the same, but very similar. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.